when I got saved back in 1996, it took me about three years, almost three years to stop drinking. I, I used to drink every weekend with my buddies and, you know, and all the things that come from that drink. And I did as well too, keeping late hours and chasing the ladies, things of that nature. And during that time, I knew I was saved. It bothered me a lot that I, I couldn't stop doing that. I mean, there were many hours of prayer and late nights of tears trying to overcome that. And when you're a Christian, you hear everything from, you know, you could lose your salvation. And if not that, God's going to intervene in your life and cause you some kind of destruction or you're a second class or third class Christian because you can't overcome your sin. And you just you're just miserable. You wonder if you're even saved at all. And I wonder if there's many of you out there like that, that struggle, struggle with that in, in your Christian walk, that maybe there's a sin that's overcoming you and you're just like, man, there's no way in the world God could love me or I'm not saved or I'm not forgiven and et cetera, et cetera. And you're trying to overcome that. And I wonder if like me, if you've heard a verse like 1 Corinthians 6 um, verses 9 through 11 read to you and there it says that, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. You're always taught to focus on your sins when this passage is not about your sins as much as it is about identity. When you see things, all these sins mentioned, I mean, some of them include what I what I was struggling with, drunkard, fornication, revilers. Those are things that I struggled with. And I'm sure many of you struggle with those, if not more. And you're taught to believe that this is you. You will not inherit the kingdom of God unless you stop doing these things. You overcome all the sin in your life perfectly. And to the to the level of satisfaction that those people teaching you these things are are OK with. That's how this goes. And your whole life may be surrounded with, man, I can't overcome these sins. It's just focused on sins and you struggle and you read this passage like, man, I'm, I, I can't be saved. But what this passage is about is, again, it's about identity. It's not necessarily about the sin. We all we all. We all sin. And what Paul is talking about is the difference between the righteous and the unrighteous in this particular occasion. If you notice in this whole section, he's talking about Christians who were acting like the like unbelievers in that they were contributing lawsuits or they were taking out lawsuits against each other, not able to reason with each other and love each other and figure out the problems they were having, that they were being they were taking them in front of the courts that were run by unbelievers. And it just it just made the faith look like, you know, of no effect. Why be a Christian when you guys are acting just like the rest of the world? And that's where these sins come in. You know, the problem isn't so much these sins. It's what Paul says here. He says he says at the beginning, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? This section of scripture is about the righteous and the unrighteous. And who are the righteous? The righteous are Christians. They're believers. They're you and me if you're a Christian. The unrighteous are unbelievers. All these sins that, that are marked out in this section of scripture are what the unrighteous do to the level where that's who they identify they, themselves as. Just look at society now where all we see is all everybody talking about the, the sexual immorality and all the things surrounding that. And none of it has to do with being righteous or unrighteous. It's, yeah, you're lost. That's what it is. The unrighteous do these things. Christians may stumble in these areas as they come out of these sins, but it's not who we are as Christians. So when you look at this, the righteous are believers. And this section says the unrighteous are the ones who are marked by these sins. Because Romans 8 talks about, Romans 8, 17, Galatians 3, 29, Galatians 4, 7, all talk about being heirs of God and our inheritance that we have. This means that we are Christians because as this verse says, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God, but the righteous are already heirs of God, heirs of Christ. We have eternal life. So, so we are inheriting the kingdom of God. It doesn't make these sins right. These sins are terrible, but we have to realize that sin is so terrible that it deserves the death of God as payment. We don't have a life to give and we can't sacrifice it, nor would God accept it, 
nor is there anything we could do when we, we go to our confession booths and all the other things we do to try to get forgiveness, our prayers, all those things I understand. I think God understands that, but there's a better way. But And, it, and if we finish up this passage, we see in verse 11, it talks about such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. This is about identity. Paul says, such were some of you. He's saying that you're not unrighteous. You are righteous. You used to act like this and engage in all these sins, but you're not that any longer. That's not who you are. You don't need to act like the world any, any longer. You are righteous. He's, to say you, such were some of you is to talk about that's what you were in the past. It's not what you are now. And if we look closer at this, that we are now righteous children of God. As, a children, as children of God, what does it say? We're washed. What does wash mean? It means to have remitted. It means to pardon or forgive. So basically, if you were washed, that means you were forgiven. All your sins were forgiven at the cross when Jesus died. Then we go on to sanctify. What does sanctify mean? Set apart, consecrated to God. In other words, holy. So you were washed, which means you were forgiven. You were sanctified, which means you are holy. It's not something that a progressive sanctification that you need to keep getting holier through overcoming sin and all the things that we're told to do. You are forgiven, one. Two, you are sanctified, which means you are holy. And finally, justified means what? To be declared righteous. Righteous. It means you're innocent. There are no sins that God's holding you accountable for. It doesn't mean sin is correct. But sin is another way God deals with sin. It's with his love. And when you understand his love and you're feeling his love, you're not going to be going to sin in order to find love. But what we need to focus on in this passage is that the unrighteous are the ones that won't inherit the kingdom of God because the unrighteous have not, are not referred to as such as such some were you in the past. They're not referred to each other in the past tense. We're washed. We're sanctified. We're justified. We're forgiven, we're holy, we're righteous. These are Christians. So the sins that, that are discussed in this section are not something that's consistent with the Christian identity. You wouldn't expect to see somebody who say, I'm, I'm, I'm washed, cleansed, and sanctified, and justified, and holy, and righteous. You're not going to see any Christian that, oh, now I'm going to go out and, and live, like, live like the unrighteous. If some do, well, they're probably lost. They probably are unrighteous and don't understand what the gospel is and never truly came to Christ to begin with. But don't let this passage of scripture be used to undermine your salvation. You know you accepted Jesus Christ. When he looks at you, he sees you as, as washed, sanctified, and justified, forgiven, holy, and righteous. That's how God sees you. If you're struggling with these sins, you need to understand, well, what is your understanding of the gospel? Do you believe you're forgiven? Why do you feel these sins are going to give you something that maybe you don't believe the Lord has given you? But what you do, if you're struggling with these sins and you want to stop, is that you don't sit there and worry about God's going to come into your life and destroy you in some way or take your salvation away. You like you, you approach God, thank him for the forgiveness you have. And you say, Lord, what? Why am I doing this? What, what is this lifestyle that I can't overcome? Why am I doing this? That's what he did with me. When I was struggling and I knew it was wrong and all the things I was talking about, when it took me like these almost three years to stop drinking, I went to the Lord and said, Lord, why can't I stop? And you know what he said to me? Stop hanging out with my, with my friends. Stop hanging out with your friends. Because it wasn't about the, the sins that I was committing, the behavior that I was committing. It was about why I was committing those sins. I was looking for the acceptance of my friends. I was looking for the love of my friends. I was looking for that camaraderie that I got with them. And in many ways, it's like, well, why wouldn't, if I know the God of the universe, why would I not want to find these things in him? I'm accepted by him. I'm completely loved by him. So why wouldn't I go to him for these things? Because he's already freely given me those things in Christ. And that's what I had to learn. And once you're expressing that, once I started understanding that, all these sins I was struggling with, they almost went away overnight. And I'm not saying I don't struggle with sin now, I do. But I'm saying the sins that I'm talking about that I was struggling with, the alcoholism and the running around and running the streets and all that stuff, that stuff pretty much ended 
very quickly when I understood, oh, there was something better that God had given to me. And that's what I want you to realize. There's something better that God has given to you that you already have right now. You just don't believe you have it. And you're looking for sin in order to get that. And second of all, you're probably being told by other Christians that if you don't stop this, if you don't, if you continue to do this, God's going to take your salvation or he's going to destroy your life in some way. That's just not true. That's what you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. Remember that whenever somebody tries to condemn you in that way, yes, you acknowledge that sin was was wrong and you try to and you do what you need to do to approach God to get him to help you change while you're doing that. But remember, all the while you are forgiven, holy and righteous. Have a good day.